In reverse, The Shining is the most visually unifying motion art ever conceived. Backwards it operates beyond the scale of any built, ideal, or imagined form existing inside fantasy, philosophy or reality. And yet forwards the film is a horror that shows us the hotel slowly, unceasingly absorbing a human being. Jack Torrance is pulled into the hotel's mirrors until he's finally frozen as a ghost into a black and white still. The film's poster hints at this, it's a perfect object to serve as an introduction to the film. The dual color poster condenses the entire film into an errant state. There's a boy in the poster and we assume it's Danny, though it doesn't exactly look like him. Compare it to another Kubrick film. The boy bears more than a passing resemblance to the star child of 2001. Looking at both posters below, can you decide which he more looks like? Kubrick wants us to see both Danny and the star child inside The Shining's poster. As you'll slowly discover below, he mirrors every gesture in 2001 within The Shining. Now use it as a mirror. The star child ends its film in the space above the earth at a grand scale. And this yellow child ends its film small and flattened, opposite states. An even subtler meaning emerges. Danny's star child appears to be behind the wall of wherever the poster is hung. He's on the verge of being flattened into a photograph, which is the key horror of the film. A ghost inside a wall. Now to give you an idea how complex the film is, there's another meaning built into the poster. The Equindos of Palenque, a lost city set, like the Overlook, in the mountains. Ik, a mighty shaped logograph, means breath, wind. Coupled here with sunlight, it advances symbolic meanings. The film's poster slyly references both sunlight and breath, color and open mouth. Both poster and Palenque T-shaped openings are proportionally equal. Openings are in Housey, Palenque's throne room named in Mayan White House. Palenque's seat of power was in an entirely white building, the only one of its kind in the city, everything else was ornately colored. Housey was covered in highly polished white stucco which effectively reflected all light. Poster hints the view is from this Mesamerican throne room, bathed in sunlight. Another Mesamerican logograph that appears in the film is Can. It means yellow and subtly references the color of the poster without using any pure yellow in its design. While the poster's ghostly being operates as a double, or a mirror depending on how we perceive it, so does the very text that announces the film. Here Kubrick's maddeningly dense storytelling abilities come into view, he orchestrates another double meaning, instead now through the text. Though hard to believe, this T form, while ably fulfilling its role as the first letter of the also unmistakably references a Mayan logograph. The poster's T, a logogram, is the day sign Nick equal to our Monday in Maya. The first day of the Maya's calendar, and Monday, which comes from Moon Day, will later be spelled for us as an intertidal. Specifically, it's also a window shape that can only be found at the Mayan city of Palenque. Kubrick borrows the window's exact dimensions, and shows precisely how it would be used to frame a face. The window is both small to fit eyes and mouth, and is placed at medium height, precisely how it appears in the poster. In contrast to The Shining's endlessly false windows, this is a real window in a real place. Statistically, the coincidence of its framing ratio is impossible. 
Well, it may be impossible for you to believe, let alone comprehend a reason for the integration. In a footnote written for the forthcoming book, a Mayan anthropologist will verify Kubrick's use of these Mayan forms. Now you may ask, why is proving Kubrick's use important? Because Kubrick is exploring uncharted waters both in language and film storytelling. He's playing with tools of language, previously used in other much more stable contexts, and overlapping their properties and meanings. While we live in an increasingly meta age where movies seem to be merging, blending into one mediocrity after another, singularity, these tools indicate Kubrick was venturing in an opposite direction, deeper into the shroud of film reality. Kubrick's films may even be an altogether separate medium from films. Normally, a symbol so cleverly buried would go unnoticed, but as the film unravels, another Mayan symbol appears that Kubrick reuses much like the ik. The can symbol, seen repeating in the gold ballroom's carpeting, is a logograph of the word for the color yellow. Clearly this is a sly reference to the name of the room, gold equals yellow. Both symbols add layers of meaning to the film, even indirectly explain each other's presence, as well as reference supernatural occurrences later in the film. Both symbols are only to be found in the Americas. Likewise, Kubrick, who designed his film's release campaigns adroitly, used this poster only for the American release. For all other territories he used Jack's face menacing Wendy. Of course the poster is only the beginning. If we can extrapolate all of these relatable meanings from merely the film's poster, then what awaits you in the film is a deluge of buried information. Within what seems to be a streamlined, dull version of Stephen King's masterly pulp novel, Kubrick has built for us a massive and alive mysterium. A ghost story without vaporous, glowing undead or sliding chairs. Far ahead of his time, he carefully planned an unusually intricate series of continuity and orientation shifts in plain sight. To conjure the supernatural, the shifts go by so quickly the audience rarely notices even one of them. And even more importantly, the shiftings have meaning and create meaning connecting to other occurrences. In his arsenal of tools, Kubrick uses symbols, signs, archetypes, gestures, rituals and metaphors. Collapsing historically dizzying human moralities and cosmologies developed over thousands of years through visual forms. Examples Border control through maps, order control through mazes, Kubrick scatters them, then contrasts and flows them with well-planned, abnormal spadiodynamics. Special effects through intentional continuity errors, shifting props or false windows. The audience plays its role through memory and perception. What do you remember about The Shining? Kubrick is pushing all of these hidden meanings into your head, without letting you become too aware of them. Framings, colors and patterns merge and blend as animations within viewers unconscious. He shows us two similar forms, and our mind merges them. There were even two distinct hotels in the film. The simulacrum where the film is set has two sides bridged by many mirrors, not all of which are the reflective kind. How do we decrypt The Shining? By reverse engineering it. By peering into its structure. Pulling apart aspects of its tools, and forms that refer to one another, one can see roughly what Kubrick was aiming for. It's actually a pretty simple formula. The structure is largely false, and it fools the audience, manufacturing a type of subliminal phenomena. And why would he do this? Again, it's simple. 
by making you think something is real while showing you it's fake, he gets to play with the idea of meaning in your unconscious. Where language begins, or is stored. Once neurophenomenological decrypted, the shining can be seen as a beginning to a new form of post-Western visual guidance. Perhaps even a new facet of language. One day these simple teasers may be magnified inside blockbuster films and videogames that access the brain even more directly. Kubrick, a thinker's magician, is trying to teach the audience without any of us becoming aware of either lesson or method. If it is a primer for an entirely next stage visual language, then it's access to a complex key in brain science, paradox. Once we start to take apart how the dialogue is used, you'll come to realize the film is a careful satire, and in darker ways a refutation of how we share and store knowledge through Indo-European texts. The spoken English in the film is loaded with unusually nuanced visual and verbal paradoxes that escalate scene by scene. There is terror in the dialogue. The spoken horror of The Shining is, like the visuals, revealed in confabulation, nursery simplification, deception, broadcast in a variety of technologies, phone and radio, and qualities, like sarcasm and pure rage, critical components to the dread laced in the flickering visuals, that drive the film to its end. The only clear communication of the entire film is wordless, The Shining Danny sends to Halloran, that calls for his help. It's an essentially silent film within the film. As an alternate to his spoken plot, Kubrick laces visual forms throughout from indigenous American cultures, some that employed complex spoken languages without written form alphabets, like the Navajo. From a nearly decimated past, it effectively augments even bypasses Western systems of description by very subtly alerting us to their alternate visuals, motifs and even parts of their narratives and rituals. Perhaps an evolutionary tweak that doesn't or won't go away, The Shining, cruelly and mildly reviewed upon release. When I first saw The Shining I didn't love it, but it has since become one of my favorites. Steven Spielberg has evolved into a kind of cult film to adherence, could be the initialization of a movement to shift our tools en masse.